Well, good morning. What a blessing to be with you this morning while our pastor is in Oklahoma with uh, Robin and the entire family. And we had a good chance to visit with Pastor Mark this past Wednesday. We have our staff meetings on Wednesdays, and then the staff will meet also sometimes on Tuesdays. And so at our lunch meeting that we had on Wednesday, it just was a great time, I think, for Mark to talk about uh, Floyd, how he met Floyd, what their relationship was like, how many years he had known Floyd. And so Brother Floyd McKee was not only just a... Uh, just a pastor, mentor, good friend to our pastor, Pastor Mark, but also just, just a great brother in Christ, just someone you can call and talk to. Like all of us mean, men that need to have someone like that in our lives, someone we can call and talk to, be ourselves with, visit with, and just uh, share with them what's going on in our lives and, and, and our worries, fears, our hurts, whatever it may be. And Floyd was a man like that to, uh, to Pastor Mark. And so our pastor's really been hurting this week, but on Wednesday, I, I think it was so good to hear him just talk, and that led to stories, and that led to laughter, and and that was healing, but he's been in touch with us all weekend, all throughout the process of being at the funeral home with Floyd's uh, line of state, then the family being there, and then the services that were yesterday, and then at the church today, and a lot's going on, so he and Robin may be there for a couple more days, I'm not sure, or head back late tonight, but we'll be in prayer for them too, and then Many of you might know, you know, Willard Dodd, Willard and Betty Dodd in our church. And we'll go to the Lord here in prayer in just a moment, and we'll see you in just a moment. But while the life group, a leadership night was going on Thursday evening, I went up to Memorial Hermann Hospital there in the ICU, and Laura Hazelwood had met me up there. What a blessing to have her there, too. And Willard Dodd has been a member of this church for many, many years. You might remember Willard for he was a greeter in our South Foyer. And he is the one that would give you such a firm handshake. And if you had children with you, he would get down on their level and say, my, you just have the prettiest little smile. And kids would line up to see Brother Willard and go through that door to have Willard shake, you know, their hand and greet them. And so Willard is very, very sick. He's not doing well at all. And so went up there Thursday night and he had been asleep and he's in ICU. And he happened to come to while we were there. And it was just 30 minutes of prayer and praise and visit and prayer and praise and visit and Betty his wife was there and then Carrie their granddaughter was there from West Texas and a great time to visit well I'd learned through that visit really quickly that that Willard and Betty Willard's 95 years old Betty his wife is 92 years old and they've been married 77 years isn't that something 77 years how remarkable she was 15 he was 17 when they got married they lived in Oklahoma. They crossed the state line into Kansas to get married. Didn't have to have parental authorization to do it back then. But they were fearful to tell their parents what they had done, so they went back to their own homes and lived with their parents for another 90 days before they told their mom and dad that they had been married. <clears throat> I was preaching one night for Pastor Mark, and Betty Dodd was sitting in the very back on a Sunday evening, and I almost called her up here to read some scripture for me because I, I thought she would she's just that just fun personality and but the Lord led me just to call upon Lois Wilk instead to bring her up here to read some passages and so afterwards I told uh, Betty Dodd I said I was about to call on you tonight to read some verses for me and and she said brother Barry if you'd have done that I'd hit that back door so fast I'd never come back to this church if you'd done that <laughs> I'll never forget that so uh, remember in your prayer time your quiet time to lift up Willard and uh, Betty Dodd, you know, and uh, what a precious, precious saint. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, that you may be seated. And Father God, we, we do pray for our pastor and Robin, you know, this morning, and we pray for uh, Floyd's family, and we pray for his church family. Uh, you know, they're grieving right now. Just a lot of mixed emotions. Floyd is in heaven. He is, in, he is healed, and we rejoice in that, and where he is, we will be one day also. And what a, a blessed reunion awaits just all of us who have Christ Jesus in their hearts as Savior and Lord. We understand the theology of that, but we're human, we're frail, we hurt, and, uh, and it's just not good. It's just not a fun time to lose a loved one. And so, But through your Holy Spirit, that's when you do your just majestic work. You give peace that passes understanding. You uphold when we can't go on. Thank you for doing that. We lift up Brother Willer to you as well, precious, precious saint of yours. Bless him, meet his needs right now. Even as we're praying to you, may he feel a comfort, peace, and rest. And the same for Betty, his precious wife, and all of their family. Others in our church are hurting. Others in our church are so sick as well. 
we want to be mindful to pray for them because through the prayers of many, it blesses instantly those that we're praying for. And we never need to forget that. May we be mindful of prayer and go into our prayer times of intercessions and supplications for others in our church family as you would direct us. Well, bless this message. Bless the invitation this morning as well. The remainder of this day and this evening, give us a great day tomorrow. We give you praise for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. What a big week this is. Today is Super Bowl Sunday. I don't know if you follow much of the NFL or if you follow a lot of those football games. I used to watch the NFL you know, a few years back, kind of religiously, then I kind of fell off watching uh, NFL. I don't watch it all that much. I love college football, however. Don't watch the NBA. I couldn't list, tell you five players in the NBA. Love college basketball, uh, however. Didn't know a lick about professional baseball till our daughter was blessed, and we're blessed to have a new son-in-law who plays professional baseball, so that's kind of a fun sport you know, to follow. I'll watch that, you know, Major League Baseball, but uh, not much collegiate ball in that sense. But as you are aware, today's Super Bowl Sunday, Miami, Florida. I mean, they'll bring in billions and billions of dollars that will come in. They'll clear a billion dollars at least is what the football commissioner said. And Kansas City Chiefs playing the San Francisco 49ers. You know, so we all know that Kansas City Chiefs are going to win. So if you want to do other things tonight, you can do that. And, uh, you know, you never talk about, oh, look at that right there, bless your heart. The monies are all wearing San Francisco 49er sweatshirts right here on the front row. Bless your hearts. Is that the Mapses over there? Okay, so you five, if you'll come forward, we want to lay hands on you and pray for you. Count of three, let's just say bless your hearts. One, two, three, bless your hearts. So that's tonight, 5.30 p.m. Hey, wherever you're going to be, that's going to be the Super Bowl. That will be the thing. A lot of people watch it up through halftime. They love watching the halftime commercials, of course. Who doesn't? Not so sure about the halftime program. Really don't ever watch that, whoever the singers are. But I will try to tune in and get some of those commercials. And then, of course, this week also is a big week. Friday is, help me out, what is Friday? Yeah, thank you. Valentine's Day is Friday. So for you men in here, how many of you men are here with me? Oh, is it what now? Oh, am I, awake, am I a week off? So what is today, by the way? Sunday what? <laughs> Sunday the 2nd, right? Yeah, okay, so right, so we have a whole nother, so men, you're even d doubly more prepared for Valentine's Day then, right? That is coming up soon, so that's going to be Friday the 14th, month of February. What a busy, busy, uh, you know, couple weeks this will be so but Super Bowl Sunday nonetheless so I, I want to ask you a question and I want to give you a quick little homework assignment if you don't mind for me that you'll be doing in about the next 30 minutes maybe perhaps the next hour and that would be when you have your Sunday supper or your Sunday lunch or your Sunday dinner whatever you call it I'm West Texas Midland Texas born and raised we had breakfast lunch and dinner Never even knew that people called it other than that until I got older and people started calling dinner, supper, and supper, dinner, and never even used the word lunch. But whatever you call it, share with your family. You know, if there were to be a Super Bowl passage for you in the Bible or a Super, super Bowl type like verse for you in the Bible, what would that passage be or what would that verse be? You know, your family needs to know that. You know, because chances are we're not going to live forever, Right? Now, the Lord could wrap all this up and send Christ Jesus for us before this message is even over. Amen? Wouldn't that be a glorious day? Amen? There's nothing I'm looking forward to tonight, this evening, this week, the following week, Valentine's. There's nothing I'm looking forward to that I can think of for the remainder of my life that would preclude me from wanting Christ Jesus to return smack in the middle of this message, if not even right now. Amen? nothing whatsoever but should god see fit not to send christ jesus back for his bride during this message or the next five years or 10 years or 15 or 20 years who knows christ jesus himself doesn't know so we're thought god in flesh doesn't know only god the father knows one day god the father will look to his son christ jesus will tap him on the shoulder and say son go get your bride and then boy the rest is history and what a time that will be for believers in christ jesus but should the Lord God tarry 
that your family will want to know from you because you will not live forever, I will not live forever. What is your favorite verse in the Bible or what is a Super Bowl passage to you that would be in Scripture? And that's hard to define for many of you. You have many favorite verses. You have many, many favorite passages of Scripture. But have you shared that with your loved ones? Have you shared that with your children? Have you shared that with your grandchildren? Because when the Lord calls you home one day, they're going to remember a lot of things that you've done for them without a doubt. Uh, they're going to remember some gifts you had given them and some things you had shared with them. But one thing they will never forget is, is when they're reading their Bibles and they're going through Scripture in their quiet times, they're going to come across that passage or that verse that you will share with them today over lunch, and, and that will bless them, and that will comfort them, and that will give them assurance of your salvation, and that you are in heaven, and that dad, or that mom, or that my husband, or that my wife, or that my granddad, or that my grandma, they loved Jesus, and this was their favorite verse, but unfortunately, we never share that with our family, or our children, or our, our grandchildren. I was blessed to have a mother who loved the Lord, and she died at age 64, and that was in 1998. And she loved prophecy. She had a Bible I remember growing up with. It was called the Living Bible. It was a green, puffy Bible. It was like the, the cover, it was kind of like a, a cushion Bible. It was called the Living Bible. It was olive green. And I mean, she had that highlighted. She had notes written in that Bible. And she loved prophecy. She loved uh, eschatology more than anything, study of end times. She loved talking about the rapture of the church. And she loved talking about the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. And and she loved talking about heaven, and she taught a class at First Baptist Midland 20 years plus to a group of ladies year in, year out, just on those end times issues. And nine times out of ten when I preach for Pastor Mark, I'm always preaching on heaven or hell, uh, the rapture of the church, the uh, great white throne judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, or uh, the second coming of Christ. I just got that from my mom. I grew up hearing about that. My dad was a silent man in Christ. He was a born-again believer in Christ. He loved the Lord. He went home to be with the Lord a couple of years ago, age 88. Born again, saved, in heaven right now. I look forward to seeing mom and dad one day, whenever that day will be. But what I do remember about my dad, and although I don't know his favorite passage of Scripture, and I would give anything to know what that was, I wish I just would have sat down and asked him, hey, Dad, what is your favorite passage of Scripture? And, and I, I would know it today then. Now, I know he's in heaven, don't misunderstand me, but what I do remember from my dad is, is every night, every night growing up there in Midland before I would go to bed, if I went back into his bedroom where mom and dad were, uh, and if and mom was already asleep, dad would always be sitting on the edge of his bed with his Bible reading a chapter a night out of scripture. If I saw him do it once, I saw him do it countless, countless hundreds of times. And so just a love of reading scripture then came from watching my dad do that but i want to encourage you for you husbands to tell your wives you know honey should something happen to me today i'm not trying to be macabre here or vice versa you wives to your husbands you need to know this is my favorite verse in the bible or this is my favorite passage and if your kiddos are with you today at lunch and or your grandkiddos just take the initiative and share with them hey kids you know or your grandkids you need to know what my favorite verse in the bible is and just share that with them i i, I promise you when the Lord calls you home, when that may be, should it not be precluded by the rapture of the church first, should we all see a physical death first, they, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, will never, ever forget the verse or the passage of Scripture you share with them today. And that will give them comfort till the Lord calls them home. Amen? Our families know so much about us, what our favorite teams are, what our favorite sports are, what our favorite colors are, what our favorite actors are, what our favorite movies are. They know everything about us, but do they know what our favorite Bible verse is? And it shouldn't be that way for born-again believers in the church, right? I want to share with you then what my, maybe, perhaps would be Super Bowl passage of Scripture would be in the Bible, and it's found in Genesis chapter 4. So if you take your Bibles or your your Bible app on your phones or your tablets, look with me on Genesis chapter 4. And I will share with you just a few verses because for me it just sets the hallmark of what the rest of the Bible is about. And in a nutshell, to me the Bible is simply about this. God is moving one direction. Satan is moving the opposite direction. 
you're in the middle, I'm in the middle, and there is a collision that is forthcoming. God's moving this way, Satan is moving this way, and you stand in the middle, and what you do with Christ Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, behold, the Lamb of God, has everything to determine where your eternal destiny will be for all of life. That's just, to me, the Bible in a nutshell. God has one will for your life, period. And that will is that you get saved. He has thousands of plans for your life. Where are you going to go to school? Are you going to go to school, college? Are you going to go right into the workforce? Are you going to get a trade and jump right into the work world? Who are you going to marry? When are you going to marry? Where are you going to live? Uh, how many kids are you going to have? So on and so forth. Th those are great plans that God has for your life. But when it comes on the pecking order of what is his will for your life, they don't equate, they're not to be compared with his one will for your life is, and that is, is for you to get saved, period. I, I believe with all my heart, then beyond that, if he has a second will for your life is, is then that you make Jesus Christ known to as many people as possible, that you can make known with the gifts he's given you, with the personality he's given you, with the skill sets he's given you, whether you're in ministry or not, or you're in the secular world working or not, wherever God plants you, then once you're saved, you make Christ Jesus known to as many people that you can touch as possible, through your smile, through a handshake, through lifestyle evangelism, through flat-out witnessing. Everything else beside those two things, it's God's plan for your life. And God wants to give you the desires of your heart. And he will reveal what those plans are for your life the more you spend time in Scripture, the more you spend time in prayer. Just simply the more time you spend one-on-one -on -one with the Lord, so many of his plans for your life will be revealed. But his will for your life is that you get saved, that I get saved. Beyond that, I guess, presuming that he wants us to make his Many people come to Christ through our witness and testimony. I don't know what other wills he has for our life. But, but I think the stage is set for me in a passage in Genesis chapter 4. It's a Super Bowl passage for me. You know, in ministry, I remember having Super Bowl events in my ministry early on in ministry. One such Super Bowl event, what I mean by that is just a big grand event that took place that, that was just doesn't happen normally. Super Bowl comes around once a year, you know, so sometimes I watch it or not, but it's a big event none, nonetheless. So I remember one of the very first pastorates I had, I was baptizing this lady. Our baptistry was a type of baptistry that you would walk out in front of everybody. It was right behind the choir loft, and in, in the back row of the choir, I mean, the back of their heads were right on the glass line of where the water was. Well, this lady was, uh, that we baptized, was, I baptized, was a, was a rather large lady. She was, she was just a large lady, right? I'm six foot, 230 pounds. She towered me. She was bigger than me. So we come to the point where we're about to baptize her. And so I said, Barbara, do me a favor. I said, if, if you would now, if you would bend, bend your legs, then I'll have to help. Right? So I'm whispering that to her. And she said, Brother Barry, I can't. I've just had double knee replacement surgery, and I can't bend my knees. So I'm thinking, okay. So... Now, we're live in front of everybody, right? So what do I do? So I take my one leg, and I sweep both of her legs. So she floats up like this. I push down on her. Water goes out of the baptistry onto the back row choir members. My waders fill up with water. I always wear bathing suits now. Whenever I'm baptizing, I have a bathing suit on. Back then, I would put, take my suit jacket off, and I step into these, you know, these fishing waders. And then, and then so I can hurry and get out of them so I can get ready for the message to preach. And I remember taking those suit pants off and wringing them out and putting them on and preaching dripping water. Super Bowl event. One time I was called to Arlington Memorial Hospital and an elderly lady, 89 years old, had passed away. And the grandson was there and the grandson's uh, girlfriend was with him and they were hysteric and and so they called me to see if I could come and maybe bring calmness or peace to the situation. And, and I get there, and the grandmother had been in triage, but the grandson and girlfriend had stormed the triage room when she passed away and did not give the medical team members there at Arlington Memorial Hospital time to prepare you know, her, her presence or her appearance for a family. And so when they came into the room, it was just a very shocking sight to say the least. It was really a rough, rough side. It was very shocking. So I wasn't prepared for that either. 
I got there about 10 minutes after she had passed and the, the grandson was hysteric there. And so I walk into the room thinking that, you know, it's going to be when someone has passed away, the team members make them presentable, then the family comes in. And so I was shocked when I walked in, in other words, but didn't let them know that. This is back in the early, early 90s. You didn't have cell phones back then. You did, but if you had a cell phone, it was mounted in your car. There's no such thing as a mobile phone, right? And so what the church did, they issued us beepers or pagers about the size of a wallet you'd put on your belt loop, and then they would call that pager, and it would vibrate, you know, or it would beep loud. And I always kept mine on silence, but I kept it on vibrate, so it would vibrate. And so I walk in there, and it was just a bad sight, not a good situation at all. And the grandson's there, the girlfriend's there, and all I'm thinking about doing is, is, we need to have prayer. And so I come up to the body and I reach my hands over the body to grab the grandson's hand, the girlfriend's hand. So we just need to start praying, y'all. And so we start praying. And about that time, our minister of youth from Lakeview Baptist Church pages me and my pager starts vibrating. And I scream in my prayer because I thought Miss Sadie was grabbing onto my belt loop, pulling on me <laughs> that I'm not dead yet. I jumped. I jumped I, like a schoolgirl. I screamed. And then it vibrated again, and I realized, oh my gosh, it's my pager. Miss Sadie's not reaching out from the dead. It scared me to death. So what did I do? I started coughing and clearing my voice as though, <coughs> you know, pardon me, you know, something, you know, like that. Super Bowl events, I have a few of them. I have several more, so I won't share those to belabor the point, but I have some of those in ministry. You have those likewise. Look at Genesis chapter 4 with me. Before I get to Genesis chapter 4, I want to give a little bit of the context, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, very clear, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, therefore man has a body, breathed into his life, uh, breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, therefore man got a spirit, and man became a living soul, man has a soul, Genesis 2, 7, therefore God formed man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, man became a living soul. You have a body, you have a soul, you have a spirit. I have a body, I have a soul, I have a spirit. I can see your body right now, you can see my body right now. Your spirit's living in you right now, your physical spirit is, mine likewise. I can see you breathing, you can see me breathing. It means wind, it means air, it's spirit is what that means. If the Greek word for spirit's pneuma, a pneumatic drill is compressed air. And then it says, and as a result of that, man then became a living soul. Now, the thing is, I can't see your soul, and I can't see, you can't see my soul, but your soul is living inside of you, and my soul is living inside of me. And when I die one day, should I die before the rapture of the church, I will die, and you will see my body hit the ground if you're there when I die. Or you'll go to my funeral, perhaps, and you'll see my body in the casket. And that's my body. My spirit's gone. I'm no longer breathing. The air has left me. Old, old, old medical time days, someone had passed away, the old Western movies you'd see. And if they were dead or not, if the doctor wasn't sure, he'd hold a mirror up to, you know, or some type of glass up to the nostrils of that person to see if they would fog the mirror or not. And if they didn't, well, they were dead. There was no more air in them, right? But that soul, but that soul goes on to live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And why Genesis 4 in just a moment is so important to me is because what is the destiny of your soul one day when the Lord calls you home, should he call you home before the rapture of the church? Where will your soul go and be when Christ Jesus was crucified and then when he was uh, buried, when he was resurrected, he first appeared to his disciples, if you recall the story there in the upper room, the doors were sealed, you know, the windows were sealed just the walls in the upper room, and he appears through the walls, right? He appears through the walls. And it says in Scripture in Luke, it says that they were frightened for they thought that they had seen a ghost or a spirit. And Christ said, his resurrected body, I am not a spirit, for a spirit or a ghost doesn't have flesh and bone as you see me have. Christ's resurrected body, his soul, is like our resurrected bodies one day. Our soul is going to have flesh and bone. Don't know what type of circulatory system it will have, but Christ lost all of his blood on the cross. I mean, he died on the cross, and a Roman soldier punctured his side and pulled the sword back out, and blood and water came out, coagulated, separated, a sure sign of death. Scripture is very clear, according to the Apostle Paul in Corinthians, that flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
Christ's resurrected body said, for a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as you see me have. Our resurrected bodies will be that of flesh and bone. Some type of a circulatory system. It's not going to be blood. Why is that? Christ lost his blood on the cross for you and me. Every sin known to man, there's something wrong with our blood. We were conceived with bad blood. We were born with bad blood. Therefore, only the blood of the lamb can forgive your bad blood and my bad blood. And the blood of the lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ. The lamb, the lamb, the lamb. We'll recognize one another in heaven, no doubt. And what a day that will be. Our resurrected bodies will look a whole lot like us, but perfected. No more illnesses. No longer sick. No more showing the effects of our signs of aging and wear. Some say that we'll all be in the mid-30s, 33. Christ is 33 when he's crucified, resurrected. We might have a body like his, therefore. We may be in our 30s as well. Who knows? I don't know. Scripture doesn't really address it clearly. That's one of the theological questions that if you were to ask me, what will we look at? I don't know. We'll know one another. We'll recognize one another. We'll have bodies much like this, a body of flesh and bone. But you have a body, you have a soul, you have a spirit. One day you will die and that body will cease to exist. One day that spirit will leave you. I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit leaving you. You're still by the Holy Spirit. But the air in your lungs will leave you, but your soul will live forever and ever and ever and ever. It will either live in heaven for all of eternity, and what glory will that be? And the things we will do will be just incredible. Remember, uh, Thomas was wanting to touch Jesus and touch me not, for I've not yet ascended you know, to my father or Mary earlier. And just what hours later, Thomas puts his hands in Jesus' hands and his hands and his feet. I mean, Christ Jesus had gone from terra firma earth up to the third heaven, from the third heaven back to earth in just like nanoseconds like that for Thomas to touch him. Just what our bodies will be like will be incredible, those resurrected bodies, amen. Or those souls will burn in the lake of fire forever as well. Christ said on the cross in Psalm 22, I am but a worm. He called himself, he likened himself into a worm on cross. You're talking about a place that when people die, they go to the lake of fire where the worm dieth not. Goes on for all of eternity and suffering and fire and burning. What a thing, what a concept. That's the background stage. That's Genesis 2, 7. God formed man out of the dust of the ground. Boom, he gets a body. Breathed his nostrils a breath of life. Man gets a spirit. Man became a living soul, body, soul, spirit. Fast forward, then all of Genesis chapter 3 is just a beautiful creation, more of the creation. And then Satan comes on the scene. Behind every mighty movement of God, Satan's on the scene to thwart that movement. It's a pattern in Scripture. Every mighty movement of God, Satan is behind such, afterwards coming behind such, to thwart what that incredible movement of God was just beforehand. All throughout Scripture, it just happens that way. It's just an incredible, wonderful pattern. Genesis 3, they have access to the tree of life. They can live forever if they eat from that tree. They can live forever in sinless perfection and child-rearing and childbearing and perfection. Only the tree of knowledge of good and evil don't eat from it in the day you have will but shall surely die and satan comes on the scene yea if god said and he changes that in genesis 3 but then you know the rest is the the curse of woman the curse of man the curse of satan so what do adam and eve do quickly they atone for their sins in genesis 3 and they put fig leaves to cover their nakedness fig leaves is a type of works it's them atoning for their own sins well why are you hiding and who told you you were naked and in their embarrassment, they fashioned fig leaves to cover their nakedness. And my children know this verse by heart because I shared it with them. It's one of the most important verses in Scripture. Before I get to Genesis 4, look at Genesis chapter 3 with me. Verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. Super Bowl verse for Barry Clinton there before I get to the Super Bowl passage of Genesis 4. Man atones for his sins. He puts together fig leaves. God says fig leaves won't atone for your sin. Blood has to be atoned for your sin. And therefore, an innocent lamb. I'm telling you right now, the coat of skin came from a precious little baby lamb. The blood of that lamb was spilt. They took the hide of that lamb, they fashioned the skin of that lamb, and coats of skins were created for Adam and Eve to atone for their nakedness. Man wants to give God works. I'm a good person, God. When I die, will you just look at me? You know my heart. 
and, and surely my good works at a scale will be like this, and my bad works are going to be like that. And, and surely, you know, you know, the old man and I, we have things figured out together. And he knows that when I die, that I'm a pretty good old boy, and that I probably will go to heaven because, you know, I do have more good works than bad works, and nothing could be further from the truth. But I'm a religious person, God. You don't understand. I'm a religious person. Surely you'll let me into heaven when I die because I'm a, I'm a religious church-going person. And let's conclude now with this then in Genesis chapter 4. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Two brothers, one is a shepherd, a keeper of the sheep. One is a tiller of the ground. By the way, cursed ground that God cursed in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 3, and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Verse 4, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very, very wroth, and his countenance fell. Adam and Eve leave the Garden of Eden. It's protected now by a cherubim to this very day, supernatural angel created by God that is spinning continuously with swords drawn to guard the entrance into the Garden of Eden to this very day. They leave the Garden of Eden and they said, oh my gosh, we atone for our sins with fig leaves. Later, Christ cursed the fig tree later on in the New Testament, by the way, to doubly emphasize that religion won't get you to heaven. And he had to kill a sheep and so he gave us these skins. So you know that they rehearsed it in the ears of, of Abel and Cain. Now, when we go to church and when we give an offering to God, this is what we do to give an offering to God. You must bring a lamb that will be slain, God will accept such. He won't accept anything else for an offering to him. Now these boys grow up and they're bringing their own offerings as they've been taught by their mom and dad. And Abel brings a sheep, a lamb, and Cain brings of the best fruit he had from a cursed ground. And God accepts Abel's sacrifice, but yet he does not accept Cain's. And Cain's very upset. He's just, he's just beyond mad, obviously. Verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth and why is thou count countenance fallen? If thou doest well, in other words, you know what to do, Cain. Just go to Abel, your brother, ask him for a lamb. He will give you a lamb. Bring the lamb to me, sacrifice it. I'll accept that sacrifice and let's get on with it. Come on. That's what God is telling Cain. Why art thou wroth, verse 6, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt, shalt thou not be accepted? If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Cain, you've got a choice. I'm going this direction. Satan's going this direction. You're in the middle. You know what to do to do what is right. Get a lamb, sacrifice it. I'll accept it. Should you not, sin is going to dominate you and rule over you, and you will be subservient to sin for all of your life. You've got a choice. Make it right. Go talk to Abel. Then I conclude with this verse. Eight, and Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Super Bowl passage to me, if ever there was a Super Bowl passage. Verse nine, and the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? That's a whole nother message. God asked Cain a question, a murderer and a liar, and his response was, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? Social gospel takes that passage and said, you as Christians, you are your brother's keeper. And we should be. We need to love the lost and love the hurting and love the oppressed. But social gospel says you do that to the exclusion of sharing the gospel of Christ. You meet someone's needs. Who cares about sharing the gospel with them? You just make them warm and feed them. Yes, we do want to do that. But we want to share Christ Jesus first and foremost. Amen? That's a whole other message. Am I my brother's keeper? My Super Bowl passage then, it's woven through Scripture. And if you'll give me two or three more minutes, I'll conclude this, this message. It's, it's just beautifully woven throughout all of Scripture. W.A. Criswell would say that his Bible, according to him, 
there was a scarlet thread of redemption rolling throughout all of his Bible, and I understand that. If you were to ask me what type of thread is woven through my Bible, to me it's just the thread of the lamb, the thread of the lamb, the thread of the lamb, the blood of the lamb, the blood of the lamb, the blood of the lamb. It began in Genesis 3.21. A lamb was killed to atone for sin for Adam and Eve. And then you go on to Genesis chapter 22, verse 8. Abraham's about to sacrifice Isaac, his own son, and Isaac asks a question and says, Behold that, I see the wood and I see the fire for the altar, but where is the sacrifice for uh, the uh, for the sacrifice? And Abraham is just, I'm sure he's just dying. I mean, he's about to sacrifice his son. He's not going to say, well, Isaac, you're that sacrifice. What does Abraham say? My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. Genesis 22, 8. Let's not forget, fast forward, 400 silent years from Malachi to Matthew, 400 silent years, and all of a sudden, John chapter 1, verse 29, Christ Jesus comes on the scene, and John simply says this, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. It's like the Holy Spirit says, you better get this, it's in the beginning of your Bible, it's smack in the middle of your Bible, and I'm going to put it in the very end of your Bible. In Genesis, I mean, Revelation chapter 5. I conclude with these few verses. You've been very patient and long-suffering with me this morning. But let me read them to you because it closes out this message. It closes out Scripture and this thread of the Lamb through my Bible. The Apostle John is talking. He's been called up to the third heaven. He is recording what he has seen and what will occur and what has occurred. In Genesis 5, it says, uh, Revelation 5, pardon me, it says, and I saw the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And John says, and, and no man in heaven, nor in earth, nor under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And John says, and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open or to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, to John, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So lest we debate who is that lion from the tribe of Judah, and who is this person? The Holy Spirit just pricks John's heart and says, and, and then follow with this, write this. Very next verse, John writes, and I beheld, you know, he's talking about this line from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And then it says, And the four beasts and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, capital L, Christ Jesus, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song unto the Lamb. To me, Super Bowl passages is, is it's not about religion to get you to heaven. It's about the Lamb. If you're a Southern Baptist, great. What have you done with Jesus? If you're Roman Catholic, wonderful. My goodness, beautiful liturgy, beautiful architecture, incredible. What have you done with Jesus? If you're Methodist, awesome. Baptists who can really read, what have you done with Jesus? Some of you got that. If you're a Presbyterian, a wealthy Methodist, great. What have you done with Christ Jesus? If you're Episcopal, wonderful, wealthy Presbyterians. What have you done with Jesus? And I'll ask people all the time, hey, do you know Christ as Savior? Or do you know, are you a believer? Oh, yes, I'm a, well, good, I didn't ask you about that. So what have you done with the Lamb? My question to you this morning as we come to the invitation of our service is, what have you done with the Lamb? It's all about the lamb. It's all about the lamb. It, it begins in the Bible with the lamb that was slain because of sin of Adam and Eve, our great, 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 all the way 6,000 years ago ancestors. 
a lamb, an innocent lamb was slain to atone for their sins. I don't know, my son, but God will provide himself a sacrifice. God in flesh, Christ Jesus. Behold, the lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. It's a lamb, it's a lamb, it's a lamb, it's Christ Jesus. No one's worthy to loosen the seven seals thereof. No one above heaven, under heaven, on earth, under earth. No one was worthy to loosen. And I looked and behold, a lamb as though it had the appearance that had been slain. The lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, was worthy to loosen the seals thereof. What have you done with the lamb? You're a churchgoer, wonderful. You're a good person, just incredible. We need that. More importantly, though, what have you done with the lamb? 